Good morning. Uh, my name is Pranita Tama, and I'm excited to talk to you today about some new beta-lactam agents on the horizon for the treatment of metallobeta-lactamase producing infections. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so I have no disclosures and I'm gonna briefly review the landscape of some FDA approved novel beta-lactam agents. And then I'm going to focus mostly on the preclinical and clinical activity of two antibiotics, astreonam avibactam and cefepime tanaborbactam. And then I'm going to briefly review some other beta-lactam agents in late phase trials. So just as a quick overview, uh, in the last 10 years or so, there's been about five new beta-lactam agents that became clinically available. Four of these are beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitors, and one of these is sefiterocol. And of course, there are differences in the availability of these antibiotics in different parts of the world. When we think about some of the carbapenemase production in Enterobacterialis, so we think of three main types of carbapenemases, the KPCs and the OXA48-like uh, carbapenemases, which are in a category called serine carbapenemases, and the NDMs, which stand for New Delhi metallobetalactamases, are in a family called metallobetalactamases. And in the metallobetalactamases, there are two other carbapenemases produced, called VIMS, or Verona Integrin Mediated Carbapenemases, as well as um, IMPS, which stand for imipenemases. Um, so again, the NDMs, the IMPS, the VIMS are, are metallobetalactamases. So when we look at the KPCs, as you can see in the chart here, uh, we have several antibiotics with activity, which is great. When we think about the New Delhi metallobetalactamases, as, long, as, as well as the other metallobetalactamases, the, the availability of antibiotics is much more limited. There's actually no beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitors currently available with activity against metallobetalactamases. Um, the only drug we have is actually sefiterocol. For the OXA48-like producing carbapenemases, active agents include ceftazidime avibactam as well as sefiterocol. When it gets to difficult to treat Pseudomonas aeruginosa, so these are Pseudomonas that are resistant to all our traditional beta-lactams, including carbapenem antibiotics, as well as the fluoroquinolones, you can see that uh, we have several agents with activity shown in yellow here, but for all of these agents, the likelihood of activity um, is very variable, uh, and it's probably somewhere between 50 to 70%, depending on the drug. So it's definitely recommended to always confirm susceptibility before you prescribe one of these agents, um, because it's not guaranteed that these drugs will be active against the difficult to treat Pseudomonas aeruginosa isolate. So Fidericol has the highest activity against Pseudomonas um, compared to the other agents on this table, um, but we have limited clinical experience in, in terms of um, the effectiveness of sefiterocol for pseudomonas. And I say that because the clinical trial that had a subgroup of carbapenem resistant pseudomonas treated with sefiterocol, our, our best available therapy, which really was colistin based regimens, only showed about equivalent results um, and did not indicate that sefiterocol was superior. And then when it comes to carbapenem resistant acinetobacter, unfortunately, we have very few treatment options. The only drug on this chart with activity is sefiterocol, but there are some very concerning preclinical um, and clinical trial data with the use of sefiterocol for acinita, for carbapenem resistant acinetobacter isolates. Uh, one drug, one organism which sefiterocol does have some very good data is stenotrophomonas multophilia. We don't have enough clinical data on the use of this drug against stenotrophomonas, but the concentrations needed to, to kill this bacteria in animal models um, is, is quite low. Um, and there's really not been any isolates of stenotrophomonas multophilia uh, exhibiting resistance to sefiterocol. 
So let's start with astreonam abibactam. So briefly, astreonam is a beta-lactam antibiotic, and its target of action is penicillin binding protein 3. And it's actually very specific for penicillin binding protein 3. The metallobetalactamases like the NDMs, the VIMs, the IMPs are unable to hydrolyze astreonam, which is very good. So astreonam can successfully reach penicillin binding protein 3. Now, unfortunately, whenever we have enzymes like NDMs, uh, the genes producing them are generally found on mobile genetic elements with other uh, serine beta-lactamase producing genes, such as ESBL genes, AMC genes, KPC genes, and OXA48-like genes. And these genes encode enzymes that very easily can hydrolyze astreonam, so it won't make it to its penicillin-binding protein-3 target. But the good news is when it's paired with avibactam, which is a beta-lactamase inhibitor, um, it is able to reach its target mostly. And the reason is avibactam is a much smaller molecule, a lower molecular weight. It diffuses through the bacterial porins much quicker than astreonam. So it, it finds these serine beta-lactamases and binds to them and basically inhibit them from inactivating astreonam. So astreonam can successfully reach its target. So one question we want to ask are how common are metallobetalactamases? And I'll start with data in the United States. Um, and basically what we have on the slide are the five main carbapenemase genes um, worldwide. The KPCs in yellow are the metallobetalactamases, and then the bottom are the OXA48-like enzymes. So in the United States, um, when we think of carbapenem-resistant enterobacterialis in, in general, about half of isolates, looking at data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on the left and on the right is the Crackle Consortium from, from the Antibiotic Resistance Leadership Group. Um, you could see that about half of CRE in the United States produce a carbapenemase. And of the carbapenemases, uh, about 10% produce metallobetalactamases. And this percentage is higher in many parts of the world in some areas like Argentina, it's almost half of the carbapenemases being produced by CRE um, are metallobetalactamases. So it's of course important to know your local epidemiology to understand how big of a problem it is. But even in a country like the US where it's only 10% of our carbapenemase producing enterobacterialis or metallobetalactamases, this number is expected to increase over time as there continues to be more um, medical tourism as well as uh, global tourism in general. Um, and these uh, the boundaries for some of these resistance mechanisms is becoming less and less rigid. And what about Pseudomonas aeruginosa? So in the United States, as an example, out of our carbapenem resistant Pseudomonas, as you can see on the slide, about 1% of isolates produce carbapenemases, and those tend to be metallobetalactamases, specifically vim betalactamases. So in the US, about 1% of our carbapenem resistant pseudomonas produce uh, metallobetalactamase enzymes. And this is very different from what we're seeing globally. In Latin America, almost 20% of carbapenem resistant pseudomonas are producing these enzymes. In, in Australia, New Zealand, this is almost half of pseudomonas isolates. The Middle East, about 22%. And although Europe is not being included in this cohort, there are studies from Europe um, suggesting about 10 to 20 percent and potentially higher in some countries of carbapenem resistant pseudomonas are producing metallobetalactamase enzymes. So let's go back to the enterobacterialis, so specifically NDM producing enterobacterialis. So these are data from the United States CDC where they looked at 64 clinical isolates from 24 of the 50 United States. There are not currently astreonam abibactam breakpoints. The way it occurs um, is that when a drug is being approved by the, the United States Food and Drug Administration, um, the company making the drug that, that's developed the drug proposes breakpoints and the FDA either approves those or, or rejects those breakpoints. And then separately, the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute or the CLSI um, reviews all the literature and makes their own assessments about what appropriate breakpoints should be. 
most of the time they're the same as the FDA, but there are times they're different. So because we don't know how, what the breakpoints of Astrina Mavivactam are, we can't really say what percent of isolates are susceptible or not. But let's say we go with the Astrianam breakpoints of four or less. Um, using that cutoff, um, in this cohort of isolates, 86% of these NDM-producing Enterobacterialis, and again, the NDM-producing are the by far the most common of the metallobalactamase-producing enzymes um, in, in both North America and Latin America and South America. Um, but 86% of these isolates would have been susceptible to Astrina mabibactam using four as the cutoff. And if we go one dilution higher with the MIC of eight, about 97% of isolates would be susceptible to Astrina mabibactam. And this is similar to what's been found in other cohorts from around the world. Um, if you look at the middle column with the NDMs, you could see that there is a little bit of a range, but for the most part, uh, Estrinum avibactin is active against probably around 90% or so of isolates. Again, depending on what MIC cutoff you use, these numbers will vary. Um, and I will just caution you that most of these data are put out by the company manufacturing this drug or the, um, is sponsored by, by the company. So there is a, you have to take these data with a little bit of grain of salt. These are isolates that have never been exposed to the drug. Um, so in real life clinical practice, we'll probably see that these percentages decline somewhat. But the good news about Astrinum abibactum is you could see here that even for KPCs or OXA48-like, this drug is quite active. And it's also actually important to note that for non-carbapenemase producing series, so again, this is about half of our carbapenem resistant enterobacterialis isolates, it also retains good activity. So the moral of the slide is that Astrina mavibactam seems to perform well against carbapenem resistant enterobacterialis, regardless of whether a carbapenemase is being produced or which carbapenemase is being produced. So one question people wanna know is um, of, often is, how well does ceftazidim abibactam and astrianem, so these two drugs predict um, astrianem abibactam activity? Um, and this is important because right now we don't have access to astrianem abibactam. Some people argue that because ceftazidim, even though it primarily targets penicillin binding protein three, it also has some other penicillin binding protein targets that perhaps it might have some increased activity compared to astrinum abibactum. And others have proposed that, um, if you remember, astrinum is susceptible to hydrolysis by a lot of serine beta-lactamases, which the abibactum inhibits. But by using the combination of ceftazabi and astrinum, you have one additional beta-lactam, ceftazidine, which could potentially serve as a decoy. So a lot of these serine beta-lactamases are attacking the ceftazidine, so the astrianam has an even better chance of reaching its penicillin binding protein three target. So the CDC looked into this question um, on the same cohort of, of uh, metallobalactamase producing isolates I showed you earlier. And the good news is the MICs for ceftazabi astrianam and astrianam abibactam are within um, one doubling dilution. So we would say within the standard of error. So even if you're unable to test ceftazabi and astrinam because we don't currently have a standardized method that's accepted by the CLSI as the approach we should use to test activity of this combination, if uh, MICs are available for astrinam abi backed them by broth microdilution, there are, at least in the United States, some health, state health laboratories that can do this testing. Um, you can use these uh, MICs interchangeably. But the bad news is we're not getting any additional activity with the combination of ceftazidime, abibactam, and astrianam compared to astrianam and abibactam alone. Um, so let's talk about some of the mechanisms of resistance. Again, we're still just focusing on the enterobacterialis for astrianam, abibactam. So for E. coli, and you can see that there's a lot of references at the bottom of the slide that support this idea. What generally happens for E. coli that develops resistance to Estrinam abibactam is there's a four amino acid insertion um, in penicillin binding protein three. So again, the target of Estrinam 
at position 333 in conjunction with other beta-lactamases. Now, if you just had this insertion by itself at PBP3, this might inactivate as trienam, but other drugs like mirapenem, where PBP2 is the main target, um, would be just fine being active. But when you have this insertion in PBP3 along with, um, for example, New Delhi metallo beta-lactamases that are going to basically inactivate all the other available beta-lactams, then you're in real trouble because you really don't have any other options available. Um, if for other species that are not E. coli, we don't have great evidence yet about common mechanisms of resistance. Um, some species have been found to have PER or VEB genes, which are types of class A enzymes, beta-lactamase enzymes, um, that um, seem to uh, basically, as trimabibactam is not very active against organisms producing these enzymes. And then sometimes, um, some, some data have suggested that increased uh, pr uh, expression of efflux pumps are poor in mutations that don't allow the drug in are other reasons why resistance might be seen. So we're still learning, but at least for E. coli, um, what's been reproducible is this four amino acid insertion at penicillin binding protein three in conjunction with um, generally metallo-beta-lactamase enzymes. So I wanted to give you an example of a patient we had at Johns Hopkins Hospital. This is a 66-year-old man living in the United States who had traveled to India in January of 2022 for a kidney transplant from a living-related donor. And between, between July and September of 2022, he had six emergency department visits for cystitis so a, a mild um, lower rest, a urinary tract infection, the urine cultures grew E. coli, which was resistant to all routinely tested beta-lactam agents. So in this hospital, they didn't, um, they were unable to test for septazidem abibactam, but they went ahead and prescribed it each time he presented to their emergency department. Within 48 hours of discontinuing antibiotics, he presented to our hospital with a temperature of 101, with rigors and with pain over his donor kidney site. So he presented looking quite ill. At Johns Hopkins, he was initiated on the combination of septazidem, abibactam, and estrianem, um, both as extended infusion, because of this history of medical care in India. And, and the urine culture grew a large amount of E. coli, which was NDM producing, but surprisingly, the isolate was resistant to both sephiterocol as well as the combination of septazidem, abibactam, and astrianem. Um, and we did use the combination of septazavi, astrianem, because we felt we didn't have any other options. Um, and we thought maybe there may still be some in vitro activity translating to some clinical use for this drug for this patient. But he did unfortunately have a relapse of infect his infection within three weeks. So this is what um, the plate looked like for him when we tested cefidrocol. You could see the zone of inhibition is quite uh, small. For astrianem, um, in combination with ceftazidem abibactam, it did seem like the zone of inhibition was a little larger around the astrianem near the ceftazavi disc. But then we did another test that was repeated in triplicate called the broth disc elution test. This is something currently being re reviewed by the CLSI. Um, there was a multi-center study published in JCM uh, where there was 98% categorical agreement with this approach in a three-center study. Um, so hopefully this is an approach laboratories can use while we're waiting for astrianem abibactam. But basically, um, just to review the, these, the slide, on the left is the growth control. So this is the E. coli isolate from our patient with no antibiotics. The next tube shows astrianem alone, followed by septazidem abibactam, and finally, astrinam in the presence of septazidem abibactam. And you can see that in the last tube, there still continues to be turbidity. Um, it should be clear if this drug was active. Um, and then we did confirm astrinam abibactam MICs by broth microdilution, and the MIC was 16 over four, um, which we would not consider to be susceptible. We sequenced using both um, short read and long read sequencing to understand what the possible mechanisms of resistance at play were in this patient's E. coli isolate. 
And it belonged to a sequence type 167 isolate, which has been described um, in Asia and in Europe as a high risk E. coli clone, meaning there's multi-drug resistance and it's spreading quite quickly. So basically what we found for our patients is he had a modified penicillin binding protein three. So as we mentioned, this is the specific target for estrenam, but it's also the primary target for sifiderocal. Sifiderocal also uses uh, penicillin binding protein two. But this, tar this change in PBP3 um, likely contributed to increased MICs to both astreonam, avibactam, as well as sifiderocal. There was a blah CMY gene, which is a plasmid-mediated MC gene. And there's been several reports in the literature that avibactam is not as efficient at, at inhibiting activity of this enzyme. So this likely contributed to some of the increased MIC to astreonam avibactam. And then there was a truncated CRA iron binding protein. And this is an, uh, an iron binding protein. Sifiderocal relies on the iron transport system to make its way into bacteria. So this likely contributed to the increased MICs to sifiderocal. Um, so again, this combination of genes um, and mutations um, along with an NDM uh, enzyme uh, contributed to resistance to basically all the drugs, beta-lactam drugs we currently have available um, for metallobetalactamase producing organisms. So this is concerning because like I said, this is a high risk clone, this sequence type our patients had that has been found in many parts of the world. And if this continues to grow and become a problem um, in, in, in new regions, including in Latin America, um, once astrinam avibactin becomes a clinical option, um, its activity is going to be uh, markedly decreased, especially because E. coli are still the predominant bacteria to carry metallobetalactamase producing entero, uh, metallobetalactamases of the enterobacterialis. So let's just quickly touch base about carbapenem resistant pseudomonas. As I mentioned in Latin America, it's about 20% of pseudomonas isolates produce metallobetalactamase enzymes. And unfortunately, you know, just looking broadly across carbapenem resistant pseudomonas, you can see that avibactam has some incremental benefit to astreonam alone, around 10%, but it's definitely not some sort of um, cure for uh, the problems we're seeing with metallobetalactamase producing pseudomonas. So I would say that this is not a good drug uh, for metallobetalactamase producing pseudomonas, and we definitely need some better options. And then briefly, I just want to talk about stenotrophomonas multifilia. This was a very nice case report from a few years ago for Maria Mojica um, from, from Colombia um, and Robert Bonomo. And basically what they found in this patient with persistent stenotrophomonas multophilia was that um, after uh, starting this combination of ceftazium, abibactam, and estreonam, uh, the bacteremia cleared. And the reason that's hypothesized is that uh, stenotrophomonas has an intrinsic L1 metallobetalactamase, um, and very similar to what we showed for the NDM enzymes, astreonam will remain active. But it also has an L2 class A betalactamase, um, which is a serine betalactamases. And basically, these can hydrolyze uh, the septazidine as well as the astreonam, and the avibactam is protective. So you're basically mimicking astreonam avibactam here. And then in various cohorts um, from, from around the world, it seems that astrinum avibactum is active against somewhere between 82% and 98% of isolates. So let's say about 90% of stenoisolates will be susceptible to astrinum avibactum based on data so far. And when resistance is seen as this um, uh, nicely done study here, um, it seems that it's either increased expression of the L1 beta-lactamase, so this is the metallobetalactamase intrinsic to stenotrophomonas, or overactivity of a multi-drug resistant efflux pump. So again, we'll know more once this drug is available clinically, how well it performs um, in the clinic for stenotrophomonas maltophilia, but it does seem promising that this or antibiotic will be helpful here. There are two clinical trials recently co completed, one comparing astrinamabibactam with, with or without metronidazole, 
versus mirapenem with or without colistin for serious infections due to gram-negative bacteria. This study is not focusing on um, highly drug-resistant bacteria. So basically, in my opinion, this study will help us know if there's any major safety concerns and, and hopefully will confirm it performs at least as well as other drugs we consider for gram-negative infections, but it really won't answer the question of will this drug perform well for the type of highly drug-resistant infections where we would actually be using it. There is another study looking at astrinam avibactam for the treatment of metallobatalactamase producing gram negatives. They limited it to the enterobacterialis and steno. They did not include pseudomonas, which I think is a good idea, because um, like I said, this drug is probably not going to be very helpful for metallobatalactamase producing pseudomonas. Um, and again, this drug, uh, this study will be helpful to get a sense of how well it performs for the type of infections we are actually interested in treating. So in summary, for astrinamavibactam, it seems to be uh, a good option for, uh, for enterobacterialis that are resistant to carbapenem. Again, re regardless of whether they produce carbapenemases or which carbapenemases is being produced, um, and it does include activity against the metallobatalactamases, and it also includes activity against stenotrophomonas, but I would not consider, consider it a great option for pseudomonas originosa that's uh, difficult to treat, or acinetobacter baumannii that's carbapenem resistant. And we anticipate that this drug will be available probably at the beginning of next year, so at the beginning of 2024 or so. But of course, um, this is this is to be seen depending on how the review by the FDA goes and, and so forth. So let's move on to cefepime tanaborbactam. Um, so this is the second beta-lactam beta-lactamase inhibitor I'll discuss. And this drug we actually anticipate could be available by the end of this year, by the end of 2023. So tanaborbactam is a reversible boronate beta-lactamase inhibitor. Um, as a boronic beta-lactamase inhibitor, it doesn't have independent beta-lactam activity like some beta-lactamases do. An example is sulbactam. Even though sulbactam of ampicillin sulbactam is a beta-lactamase inhibitor, it also independently binds to penicillin binding proteins, uh, 1A, B, and uh, 3, uh, with some activity. So tanaborbactam is an inhibitor of serine beta-lactamases, so like KPCs or OXA48-like enzymes or ESBLs and MCs, but also of certain subclasses of metallobeta-lactamases, specifically VIM and NDM. And that's good because those are the ones we would see in, in Latin America, VIM specifically for pseudomonas and NDM for the enterobacterialis. It's a weak inhibitor of IMP, the other types of metallobeta-lactamases, and fortunately, really outside of Asia, particularly East Asia, we really don't see these enzymes circulating in isolates in, in, in the Western Hemisphere. Against serine beta-lactamases, so like KPCs, it has a low inhibitor constant value, which means it doesn't take a lot of this beta-lactamase inhibitor to inhibit the activity of a KPC enzyme, and a slow dissociation rate, which is good. Um, basically, it, it, it binds up that KPC so it's not able to cause problems for the beta-lactam partner. Against metallobeta-lactamases, though, um, it has a more rapid dissociation rate. So it might bind to the NDM or bind to the VIM, um, but it dissociates quicker than the KPC. So those NDMs or VIMs can go ahead and attack um, beta-lactams. It's partnered with cefepime. Cefepime predominantly binds to penicillin binding protein 3 like astrinam, but unlike astrinam, it also has a second target, um, a less uh, prominent one, but penicillin binding protein 2. And cefepime is susceptible to hydrolysis by a number of serine and metallobatalactamases, like we know, like KPCs, NDMs, OXA48s, as well as ESBLs. Um, Tanaborbactam binds to serine and metallobatalactamases, as mentioned on, in the previous slide, limiting cefepime hydrolysis, so cefepime can successfully reach PBP3 and PBP2. The nice thing with this combination is they are both excreted virtually unchanged in the urine. They have similar pharmacokinetics, which makes them really good partners for co-administration. So in terms of um, how well cefepime tanaborbactam performs against carbapenem-resistant enterobacterialis, 
As you can see here, um, looking at KPC producers, if we use an MIC cutoff of eight or less, and again, we don't have a breakpoint because this drug is not yet FDA approved, um, it's active against 100% of isolates in this cohort, um, against metallobetalactamase is 93%, and because of some of the properties of how it binds to MBLs, this isn't surprising. And for oxa 48 like enzymes, 100%. Um, against non-carbapenemase producing CRE, so about half of our CRE that aren't producing any carbapenemase enzymes, it seems to be active against about 95% of isolates. Now, I'll caution you that um, the company that's sponsoring this drug is looking to likely propose a, a breakpoint of 16. Um, it, it's possible it might be 16. It's possible the breakpoint might be 8. So depending on what it is, these numbers will shift either up or down. Um, so what does it look like globally against CRE? Similar to what I just showed you, um, where for KPCs, oxa 48 like producers, it performs quite well. And then it's somewhere in the 80% tile for um, metallobetalactamase producing organisms, enterobacterialis. There are some animal models looking at this drug. Um, so uh, in the top and bottom are various um, types of resistance mechanisms, mostly beta-lactamase enzymes, some in conjunction with PBP3 mutations, like that four amino acid um, insertion I described earlier. In green is control, in orange is cefepime, which is essentially similar to the control, but with the addition of tanaborbactam, you see significant log decreases um, in bacterial growth in this um, complicated UTI model in a mouse. Similarly, this is a neutropenic um, thigh model in a mouse. And again, cefepime with the addition of tanaborbactam, um, looking at those black bars, you see a significant decrease um, in, in, um, in the, um, the growth of pseudomonas and enterobacterialis in these isolates. Um, so for enterobacterialis, we could say that it seems that cefepime tanaborbactam has broad activity against CRE in general, regardless of carbapenemase, as well as specifically for um, KPCs, metallobetalactamases, and oxa 48 likes, with the metallobetalactamase activity somewhere in the around 85 percentile based on data thus far. So similar to aspirin and avibactam for its performance against the CRE. In terms of resistance, um, basically similar to what we saw for Astrina mavibactam, um, data, available data suggests that for E. coli specifically, um, when we see penicillin binding protein three insertions in, in, um, uh, in uh, uh, sorry, insertions in penicillin binding protein three, um, in combination with metallobetalactamases, um, we may see resistance to cefepime tanoverbactam. It seems a little less affected than astrinam avibactam, and possibly because it also targets, cefepime also targets penicillin binding protein 2. So a PBP3 insertion won't completely knock out the activity of cefepime the way astrinam would be knocked out. Um, and when we start talking about species beyond E. coli, we don't have enough data to get a great sense of what the potential mechanisms of resistance might be, but it seems likely it's a combination of disruptions and efflux pumps, meaning increased activity, are of porins, not allowing entry of the, the antibiotic. I did want to briefly talk about omega loop amino acid substitutions. So some of you might recall that for septazinumab evactin, it's been reported that about 10% of um, uh, KPC producing isolates uh, produce uh, have um, amino acid substitutions in the omega loop. Now, the omega loop is a, an active part of the KPC enzyme. It's named because of its resemblance to the Greek letter omega. And when there's some specific um, amino acid substitutions in this loop, it basically widens the loop and traps the beta lactam, causing increased hydrolysis. So, in this case, ceftazidime of the ceftazidime adibactam combination. So how does this um, fare for um, cefepime tanaborbactam? Because cefepime tanaborbactam is also a cephalosporin-based um, beta-lactam agent. So as a clinical case focusing on ceftazidime adibactam that was uh, nicely done um, from Ryan Shields and his group, 
Um, this is an example of a patient with a Klebsiella pneumonia infection. The index isolate from this patient was, was susceptible to septazumab ebactum with an MIC of four. But in the presence of these one of these amino acid substitutions, the MIC increased significantly to greater than 256. So there was um, sh sharp resistance to ceftazim abibactam. So let's talk a little about cefepime tanaborbactam and figure out, is this omega loop um, insertions uh, that we see in the serine beta lactamase, specifically KPC enzymes, a problem here? So one group did some really nice work where they introduced KPC3 following site-directed mutagenesis to, to, to create some of these amino acid mutants, substitution mutants, in several klebnumo isolates. And very predictably, this led to septazidine abibactam resistance, but susceptibility remained to astrinam abibactam as well as cefepintanaborbactam. So this amino acid substitution alone was not enough to knock out um, the activity of these two drugs. So that's good. They then added a RAMR mutant. So this is an increase in efflux pump production and disrupted one of the porins and found resistance to astrianam abibactam as well as imipenem relibactam, but not to cefepintanaborbactam. And then after they disrupted another um, porin, they started to see cefepintanaborbactam resistance. So this is all to say that it doesn't seem that these amino acid substitutions in KPC enzymes, which reliably predict resistance to drugs like ceftazidime abibactam, is expected to cause an obvious resistance to cefepintanaborbactam. Perhaps it'll increase the MIC a little bit. Um, but when this is found in conjunction with multiple other mutations, or when there's just multiple other mutations found, that's when we'll be more likely to see resistance to cefepintanaborbactam. Now, let's talk a little bit about Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So we'll focus first on carbapenem resistant Pseudomonas that's not carbapenemase producing. So in, in Latin America, that's about 80% of them. And it seems that cefepime tanaborbactam is active. Um, and then this is confirmed in an animal model. When we look at specifically VIM producing Pseudomonas, so about 20% of the Pseudomonas isolates in Latin America, and, and it's higher in some parts of Latin America, um, you could see that um, specifically in some countries like Argentina, um, you can see that cefepime tanaborbactam is active against um, about 80-ish percent of VIM producing pseudomonas. In one cohort from the United Kingdom, this percent was much lower. So we'll, we'll learn more as the drug is available, but it seems to have some activity against VIM producing pseudomonas. So this is good unlike astrianam abibactam. And then as we talked about omega loop substitutions, so amino acid substitutions of the omega loop in the enterobacterialis, specifically in KPC enzymes, we do notice this phenomenon in pseudomonas as well. So pseudomonas produces a type of AMP-C enzyme called a pseudomonal AMP-Cs, or, or, or otherwise called pseudomonas-derived cephalosporinases are the PDCs. So again, these are AMPC beta lactamases produced by all pseudomonas. Um, some, when they're produced in large amounts, they can hydrolyze several beta lactam agents. But when there's amino acid substitutions in the omega loop of these PDC enzymes, we see resistance to ceftolazine tazobactam and ceftazidine abibactam often. And as an example, with our experience at Johns Hopkins, we looked at 28 consecutive patients with difficult to treat Pseudomonas aeruginosa isolates susceptible to ceftolazine tazobactam. They were treated with at least 72 hours of this drug. And we had Pseudomonas isolates available before and after drug exposure. So the index isolates were always susceptible. Subsequent isolates might've been colonization, might've been infection. Um, but basically um, these were uh, these subsequent isolates were after exposure to the antibiotic. And what we found um, was that 50% of these isolates developed high level resistance to ceftolazine tazobactam, predominantly due um, to um, mutations in the pseudomonas derived cephalosporinases. And surprisingly, 86% of the index isolates, which were susceptible to ceftazidime abibactam, 
developed high level resistance to Ceftaz Abbey after exposure to Ceftaltezo, even in the absence of any exposure to Ceftazidim Abibactim. And this is concerning because it tells us that there's a lot of cross resistance between these agents. And then what we also found was for Sifiderocol, about 25% of index isolates that were susceptible had fourfold or greater increases in Sifiderocol MICs after Septaltezo exposure. So it doesn't mean there was frank resistance, um, but the MICs did certainly increase. Um, so it's concerning because you could have a single amino acid substitution in the pseudomonal derived um, cephalosporinase and we can see resistance to at least two of the four drugs and potentially the third of the fourth drug. One good piece of information is that when we see these amino acid substitutions, we often see um, re, um, lowering of the imipenomrelibactam MICs. So it actually might become more active um, or go from not being active to potentially active. We don't necessarily know what this means in clinical practice. Does it mean the drug can be used and we don't have to worry about resistance emerging? Um, or is this only in the setting of continued pressure with one of these other beta-lactam agents? Um, so what are the implications of pseudomonas-derived cephalospore mutants on cefepime tanaborbactam susceptibility? We don't have a lot of data. Uh, one group from Spain looked at 14 pseudomonas isolates with PDC mutants, so they were all resistant to either septoltase or septazazi abi as expected. All were active, um, uh, susceptible to imipenomrelibactam. Um, but you could see for cefepintanaborbactam, it was active against about 71% of isolates. So perhaps there's some cross resistance, um, but it, it, it's definitely not overwhelming. And it's also possible that for these 71%, these 30, um, 29% of isolates that were resistant to cefepime tanaborbactam, that there might have been other mechanisms of resistance at play. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to stenotrophomonas multophilia. And what I'll say is that um, we don't have a lot of data on activity, theoretically, because tanaborbactam should have activity against the intrinsic metallobetalactamase in stenotrophomonas. We anticipate there should be activity um, against cefepime tanaborbactam. There is a, a phase three clinical trial um, that was uh, completed comparing cefepime tanaborbactam to mirapenem for, for urinary tract infections. Um, again, this did not include highly drug resistant organisms. So the results of this trial are not all that interesting, but at least we didn't see in what the, 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 the sponsor of this drug has put out so far, any major safety signals with this drug. So in terms of cefepime tanaborbactam, I would say that it's a great drug from what we know so far for CRE, including metallobetalactamase producing CRE. And, and I guess I should say great with a grain of salt. It's active against a large number of isolates and somewhere in about 85% of so are NDM, of NDM producing enterobacterial. So hopefully clinical data will confirm that this drug works well for CRE. Um, again, just like with Astrinum abibactam, if we do see a lot more of these PBP3 mutations in conjunction with NDMs um, circulating in E. coli isolates, this is going to be a problem for both of these drugs. Um, unlike Astrinum abibactam, um, cefepime tanaborbactam does offer a pseudomonas originosa activity, even against highly drug-resistant pseudomonas, including those producing VIM enzymes, as is seen um, in some portion of isolates in, in Latin America. And then finally, for stenotrophomonas multophilia, we don't have a lot of data, but we anticipate that it should have some activity. Um, and then, like I said, this drug is probably going to be available by the end of this year, if all things go well. So to, to summarize, both astrinam abibactam, cefepime tanaborbactam give us hope for a single beta-lactam beta-lactamase inhibitor to be active against both serine and metallobetalactamase producing Enterobacterialis and Stenotrophomonas. Um, unlike Astrinum abibactam, Cefepime tanaborbactam does provide added coverage against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So for hospital formularies, if you're struggling about which of these drugs to add, it might make more sense to add Cefepime tanaborbactam simply because for most institutions, 
um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is probably going to be our most drug-resistant gram-negative pathogen. There are three other drugs that I'm excited about that have completed or are, are embarking on at least um, phase three clinical trials. Um, these include cefepime zitabactam. Um, zitabactam is a, a DBO type of beta-lactamase inhibitor. So it does have some independent um, activity against penicillin binding proteins. Um, its spectrum of activity will probably be similar to cefepime tanaborbactam. It's being produced by a company in India. Cefepime and metazobactam is basically um, a drug that is expected to do well against ESBL producing enterobacteriology, which is certainly a problem globally. Um, it, it's basically able to um, cross link to um, CTXM ESBL enzymes much, much better than tazobactam. The big concern is that this drug, because it'll be new and with all the costs that go into producing new drugs, it will be quite expensive. Um, and markedly more expensive than a drug like mirapenem. So kind of deciding the pros, cons of carbapenem sparing with the added costs is going to be tricky. And salbactam, duralobactam hopefully should be approved and available by the, by the end of this year, 2023. But from all the preclinical and clinical data we know of so far, um, it does seem very promising for carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter baumanii. So with that, um, I'll end. Um, thank you very much. And again, I'm so sorry that I could not be there um, live um, to present and to answer questions.